Um, so yeah, Jacob is the manager of the Likey City Store. Um, and yeah, Jacob, do you want to just begin by telling us how you have become the, 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 the guru on the vintage cameras? <laughs> how did that start? The guru, it's a nice word. <laughs> so I've been buying and sell, selling Likers for quite a few years now, and the, at least the last 10 years of this has been buying and selling Leica. Not always working for Leica, but buying and selling Leica. And uh, by that, I've learned a lot about the models throughout the years. And they've not only been my profession, but also a passion. I really love them. And I try to collect the ones I can afford. Uh, so, yeah. So you have a few cameras in your own collection? Uh, yeah, so my collection is not permanent. I always accumulate a few cameras, use them for a bit, and then purge and get some more other ones uh, and what, so what's what's ridiculous. what's in your current collection so in my current collection there are quite a few vintage cameras but from like as i only got one here with me which is a, a leica 3b from 1939 uh, i've got a leica m42 with me as well but that's not my personal one that's a that's a leica property that, those uh, are that's, the, that's the one on the photograph right now is that's it? the one on the photograph right yeah. now, yes. <clears throat> Comes with a really lovely lens on it as well. Um, so this webinar is to tell you a little bit about Leica cameras and how they changed over the years, uh, from the first prototypes to the current models. Uh, so perhaps you thinking of using a vintage camera and uh, want to decide on which one. Maybe you're thinking of starting a collection and maybe you're looking for some pointers. Maybe you already have a collection, then you probably lo know a lot more than I do, and I can learn something from you. But uh, yeah, just we'll just one request: Can you just talk, speak a little bit louder? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think yeah, maybe the mic was a bit. Maybe far the away. mic was a bit far away. Is that a little bit better? That sounds better to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first of all, this is going to be only about like a rangefinder camera. So I'm not going to touch on SLRs. And uh, what is a rangefinder camera? So according to Wikipedia, it's a camera fitted with a rangefinder, typically a split image rangefinder, which is a rangefinding focusing mechanism allowing the photographer to measure the subject distance and take photographs that are in sharp focus. End of quote. Uh, so there are two types of rangefinder cameras, a coupled one, like you see in the picture, everything happens automatically, you just align two images into your viewfinder and the lens focuses automatically. And there are uncoupled uh, rangefinder cameras where you have to do these two things separately. So you find the distance on the rangefinder and dial in that distance onto the lens. They're a bit harder to use. I think we're having a, a technical problem that people are not able to view. What's happening? People are not, they're not able to view the screen. Um, oh, that's not very good. Let me just have a look. I mean, I'm seeing it on my, okay. A lot of people are saying they can see it. So if, I mean, it looks like it is working. So one thing I can probably recommend is that you um, drop out of it, exit, enter it, uh, exit the, the call and then just rejoin it. And then hopefully that will get you straight back onto the screen. Um, so yeah, I think we should continue. Okay, so uh, beginnings of Leica. Leica started in, um, in way before, I mean, light uh, optical work started a long time before Leica cameras started. And Ernst Leitz, the gentleman on the right hand side, was the owner of the company and the business mind behind it. And the gentleman on the left hand side is Oscar Barnack, who's the inventor of the first like a camera and what they gave us uh, changed the, the face of photography for years. So I don't think street photography or journalism, photographic journalism would have been the same if it was not for these two guys. And they started to work together around the year 1913, I think. Um, but they really started making cameras in the 1920s. And just to give you a, a sort of some background, uh, I just, have a few things about technology from when they were getting started. So 4T was a popular car and you had to start it with a crank. Uh, all the cinema, most of the cinema was silent. So um, 
and some people could afford a radio at home. So it was all pretty basic compared to what we're used to nowadays. Um, the cameras that were available in the 20s were, there was a lot of uh, box cameras. They used 620 roll film usually, a very poor quality, usually had a very simple lens, only one shutter speed, one aperture, and mostly for amateur use. Some more advanced cameras were uh, bellows roll film cameras. Uh, they could produce really good images, but they had slow aperture lenses and they were a bit clumsy. So we needed to use a tripod to really take a good photo. And there was a lot of plate cameras in those days and they were really, really good, uh, extremely good quality, even by today's standards, but very clumsy to use. You needed a, a glass plate for every image you took and you needed to use them on a tripod exposure times were very long so they could produce a beautiful image but not very usable and there was nothing that was handheld small size with a fast lens that, that you could sort of use to capture life as it happens so oscar barnack started working on some prototypes first one was the leica r there was very few of these produced there was only three cameras uh, as far as I know, um, and it was uh, designed to use cinematic film uh, to take still photographs. Uh, and you could put enough film to take 50 exposures, and there's a frame counter on the front that goes up to 50. Uh, there's some stories around saying that this was not really invented as a stills camera, but as a device to test cine film uh, sensitivity. So the chemical processes at the time were not as advanced and you weren't sure what sort of what sensitivity film you produced in a batch you just took a little bit of it stuck it in this took some exposures and by the level of exposure you could see what iso the film was or asa at the time and the second camera they came up with is the leica o it was it was a series of 31 prototypes and this is a very rare camera as well um, it was a lot more advanced than the Earl Leica, but still complicated to use. So to take an exposure, for example, you needed to put the lens cap back on between each exposure uh, to wind the film on. Otherwise, you would have exposed the film as is being advanced because the shutter wasn't capping in between the exposures. I did play with a replica and to change the shutter speed on it, you almost need a degree. I needed to study the instruction book uh, <laughs> cover to cover about three times before I figured it out. So it's a complicated camera to use, but very rare, very valuable. Uh, last record I found was uh, 2.4 million euros for one of those. So, Do you, do you have any idea on the UR, like uh, what the UR stands for? I did read about it somewhere, but I didn't prepare for that. I don't remember. <laughs> you can look that up later. I don't remember that. And so these were the prototypes and these kind of uh, gave uh, Oscar Barnack at Nurse Lines an idea of what they want to produce. And around, I think it was 1923, uh, sorry, 1925, uh, Ernst Light gave a green light to produce the Leica 1 Model A. It was the first production camera. It was very successful. Around 60,000 were made over the years. And it came in four different lens versions. Uh, most of them were 50 millimeter f3.5, but later on there was a premium faster aperture 50 millimeter f2.5 hectare lens. Um, it's a non-interchangeable lens camera. It doesn't have a rangefinder on it, so it's not technically a rangefinder camera. But we'll get to that in a minute. And there was a Leica One Model A, which you see on the bottom here, uh, and there was a Leica uh, One Model B, which is also called the Compo Leica. And that was the only Leica rangefinder camera with a central shutter built in. Uh, and it was produced in small numbers and mostly for people who needed central shutter functionality. So there were some things that the Model A didn't do that you could do with the Compo shutter. Then uh, Leica 1 Model C came out and that was the first Leica camera with interchangeable lenses. So you could take the lens off. Uh, but you couldn't really put it on another like a one model C because they needed to be matched to the lens. So even though you could change lenses, the factory needed to match the lenses to the camera for you. Uh, but later on in, I think in 1931, like a one model C standard came out. 
and uh, sorry, and that allowed you to change lenses in between the cameras. So it was the first truly interchangeable uh, Leica screw camera. And the lenses and the, cam uh, the cameras are marked with an engraving of the letter O on the mount. That's how you know it's a standard mount. And that's how you know you can change the lenses between different cameras. Mm. And this is an optional additional range finder. So you can put it on the hot shoe of the camera uh, on top of that. And this would give you, so you can just attach it here. And this will give you an uncoupled range finder. So this becomes an, a range finder camera, even though it's uncoupled. And we move on to the Leica 2. And so Leica 2 was introduced in 1932. And that was the first proper uh, coupled rangefinder camera from Leica. It's my favorite model because I've had a few of those over the years and they're pretty much indestructible. And it's not Leica policy, but uh, whenever one goes wrong for me, I just spray some WD-40 inside and it just, just goes. But I repeat, that's not Leica policy. We don't recommend doing that. Uh, and this one had two eyepieces. So you can see on the bottom here, there's the left eyepiece, which you use for focusing. You look through that, align the two images into one, and your subject's in focus. And then you have to move your eye over to the right one. And this one allows you to frame your photograph. So this is the actual viewfinder. And the angle of view is uh, representing a 15 millimeter lens. Um, Leica 3, that was a year later, and the improvement was uh, slow shutter speeds. So you had a normal shutter speed dial on the top. I don't know if you are looking at uh, the, my camera, but I'm holding a camera here. So on the top, we have a normal shutter speed dial. And on the first Leica 3, it was from 20th of a second to 500th. And if you switched it to 20th, it actually says 22 one it switches it over to the other shutter speed dial on the front. So if you don't see my camera, it's this one here that I'm pointing the mouse to. And this allows you to select slow shutter speeds between one second and a 20th of a second. Very useful for landscape photography or night photography, that sort of stuff. Uh, the next camera came uh, in 1933 as well. It was the Leica Reporter, it's also called the Leica 250. Some countries called it the 10 meter Leica because it took 10 meters of cine film in two cassettes. So each side uh, had a cassette in it, which was uh, removable. And uh, it allowed you to, you didn't have to shoot the whole 10 meters. So you could take five exposures and develop them without losing the rest. And it was used by professionals, for example, at beaches or popular tourist spots, they would take photos of uh, tourists walking by. They would give them a number of their photo and they could go to the Photoshop later and get the photos uh, printed as a souvenir. And there are two versions of it. There's the model FF, which is based on the Leica 3. Uh, and the shutter speeds go up to 500th of a second. And there's the model GG, which is a later version based on the, model, on the Leica 3A goes to a thousandth of a second. These are quite rare, only about 600 of them were made. Um, and if they're in original condition, they can be of uh, good value. Maybe not, not extremely expensive, but they're, they're nice collectible. Uh, and they can be tens of thousands of pounds when they're in nice original condition. And then there was lots of different variations of the screw cameras. Uh, from the Leica 3 all the way up to Leica 3G. So in 1935, Leica 3A with a top speed of one thousandth of a second. And then three years later, Leica 3B, which has moved the rangefinder and the viewfinder window, as you see here, closer together. So you didn't have to move your eye as far across between focusing and framing your photograph. It was a good improvement. Uh, 1940 was a Leica 3C, which uh, was a much ro more, more robust camera. It was a bicast uh, chassis and a one-piece top plate. So the, the, the top part of the camera was made of one piece of metal. Uh, 1940 and 49 uh, was Leica 2C and 1C, which is basically the same upgrade on the Leica 2 and Leica 1. 
1939, there was a Leica 3D, which is a really rare camera. Uh, and it's pretty much uh, almost exactly the same as the 3C, but it's got a uh, built-in self timer. And these are quite uncommon and really good to collect. And then this camera you see on the image here is a Leica 3F. Uh, that was one of the later screw mount models and the main improvement on it was the flash synchronization. So this one, this camera could shoot with flash and the previous ones didn't necessarily sync. Flash and so on the top, uh, I don't have a picture here, but it's had a film reminder. So in this bit here, this camera doesn't have it. You could turn it to mark what film you put in the camera, just in case you forget. So you can mark that you put 100 ASA film in there. And when you pick it up a couple of days from now, you, you don't have to check it. You just, it just says here. Uh, also in the 50s, there was a Leica 72. It's a really rare camera and it's probably rare because it wasn't very successful. So it was not popular and it was not produced in, in large numbers. And it was a half frame camera. So it took 72 exposures on a standard 36 exposure uh, roll of film. It was made uh, in America. Again, not very popular, so uh, not many produced, but that makes it rare and collectible. Uh, then also the Leica 2 and Leica 1 got the F upgrade in 1951. And in 1954, the Leica M system started, but there was still another Leica screw camera to come out, which is the Leica 3G, which is this one here. This is the absolute top of the Leica screw mount system. It had many improvement compared to previous models. So this one uh, has got a bigger, brighter viewfinder that uh, can uh, provide frames for 50 millimeter and 90 millimeter lenses. It's got parallax collection. So as you change the distance of focusing, the frame shifts slightly uh, to give you more precise framing. It also has geometrically progressive shutter speeds, which means it's a lot easier to change your exposure settings without having to meter every time. So every click, this is a different camera, but it's also got the geometrically progressive shutter speeds. Every click of the shutter uh, speed dial is one EV value. So that's really easy. It makes it easier for photographers to calculate exposures. And uh, this camera was in production until 1960. So a long time after new, newer, more modern cameras started, but it was, uh, it was really good and really successful. And also you see on bottom of the camera, the like of it, which is a rapid winding mechanism very often used by professional photographers who needed to shoot uh, a lot of photos in quick progression. Now, uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery. So like I was very successful for many years with these models and there was lots and lots of copies. I think according to Wikipedia, there are at least 500 different camera models that can be classified as Leica copies. So there are plenty and I'm not gonna cover all of them. I'll, thought, I'll, uh, I'll talk about a few that I think are significant. Um, so this is the Fed. It's a Soviet camera made in Soviet Union uh, and they released a number of different models which are all very, very similar to the Leica 2. This is also my first Leica uh, that I owned <laughs> a long time ago. Um, it's named after Felix, Felix Dzerzhinsky, who's a, a Russian revolutionary, revolution hero, but a really nasty character. I don't really like him very much, uh, but I'm not gonna get into politics here. But, but it's a very significant. It was made in many, in large numbers and uh, used by a lot of photographers. Another camera worth mentioning is the Quanon. Uh, it sounds very similar to a company you might have heard of. It's a company that later became known as Canon. And uh, interesting fact about it is they started selling them before they made the camera. So they were using a wooden mock-up of the camera for advertising and they used to show it to people. This is our camera. It was just a block of wood with a lens stuck onto it. Um, but yeah, and um, later on, another company decided to hire a lot of Quanon employees and start a new company called Nippon or Nika or later Nikon. And they made lots of, uh, they made a few different uh, models 
which were based on the Leicas, similar to the Leica 3s or 2s. A decent quality, nice, uh, quite collectible nowadays. And another interesting one is a British one. It's the Reed. Reed was a British company making uh, instruments for uh, and after the war, they've uh, made a nearly screw for screw copy of the Leica 3 and the Leica 1. Uh, there are only a few differences between these cameras, uh, but you can kind of use the parts interchangeably if you need to repair one. And it came with a Taylor Hobson two inch F2 lens, which is very good. And it's known for being very, very good uh, build quality, a lot better than many other Leica copies. And I thought it was worth mentioning because it's British. Uh, so yeah. Now we move on to into 1950s. And this is where um, there was a lot going on in technology, a lot going on in photography. So like I needed to step the game up. So just the background and technology, commercial jets uh, started flying uh, in the 50s. The first nuclear power plant uh, was built in the Soviet Union in the 50s. Cars were a lot, a lot nicer than the 40. Uh, this is uh, a Mercedes Benz 300 Gullwing, lovely car. Uh, the space race started with the Sputnik launched by the Russians. Um, most of American household had a TV, so uh, TV was wildly, wildly available. And cinema was not silent anymore, it's improved a lot. Um, and the cameras in the 50s uh, were improved a lot compared to the 20s as well. Uh, so Hasselblad and Rolleiflex were medium format cameras used by many, many pro photographers. Um, Contax, which was one of the main Leica's competitors, have improved a lot and perhaps for a moment it got better than Leica. So that's why Leica needed to come up with something really good. And they got so good that even the Japanese started copying them instead of uh, Leica. So Nikon have started making cameras with the same mount as contact cameras and they pretty much looked almost exactly the same so they were copying them uh, and later on Nikon released their own SLR system that was late in the 50s already uh, the Nikon F was really really successful big competition to Leica or any other camera manufacturer uh, later on so Leica, Leica's answer to this was the Leica M3. It's a big improvement of the screw mount system. Uh, it had an integrated viewfinder and a rangefinder, so they're both in one eyepiece now. It was big, bright. It had parallax collection, but correction built in. And as you change the lenses on the camera, the viewfinder changed as well. So you had frames for different focal lengths. Uh, the 51, 50 millimeter being the main one, uh, but you can also use 90 millimeter and 135 millimeter lens. And if you had a special 35 millimeter lens with goggles, um, you could use a 35 millimeter lens on this as well. This one here you see in the, in the photo is quite an early one, uh, and uh, one we had in the Leica store recently, last year, but it's not that recently, but it's in beautiful condition. And it's one of my favorite M3s I've ever seen. And as the M3 was very popular, um, there were some professionals who needed a really, really quick camera. So they needed a Leica VIP on it. And Leica's response was the Leica MP. It was a camera produced in very small numbers. It was only about 500 of them produced. And they, they came with the rapid winder Leica VIP MP. They had a few other things that are different than the M3. So the frame counter was manual. So you had to reset it manually. Uh, but in the, this was really good to probe because you could change it if you uh, needed to change the film halfway through a roll. So it was quite a useful feature for professionals. And this was only offered to special customers, uh, only offered to professionals. And it's still quite rare and collectible and their prices can go into hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, or even into uh, seven digits figure, figures. I think there was one last year that went for over a million. Uh, so they're really, uh, really collectible. Uh, later on, uh, the M2, M1 and MD came out. So it was 
kind of against logic. The M3 was first, then the M2, then the M1, rather than one, two, three, it was three, two, one. M2 was meant to be a cut down version of the M3, but some photographers consider it an upgrade because it had a built-in 35 millimeter frame. So you can use 35 millimeter lenses on it without any uh, special goggles or anything, just, uh, just a normal 35 millimeter lens. Uh, and it had the same frame counter as the MP. So professionals like the M2 quite a lot. And there was a version uh, with a self time and without, and also uh, this bit you see here could be a lever like here, which is a, a rewind film release, or it could be a button. It's called the button release then a little bit less common, still not rare, but a little bit more collectible. And then you've got the like M1, which is basically a camera that is meant to be used with uh, scientific instruments or attachments. So it hasn't got a range finder. It's only got a viewfinder. It's a very simple camera designed to use with other devices, mostly. Um, so after the M3, it's time for some improvements in the year 1967. And the improvements were quite significant. Or oh, just going back to the M2, uh, towards the life, the end of life of the M2, uh, Leica introduced a rapid film loading mechanism in there. So it was a lot quicker to load film than the M3. And this was later on used on the M4. That was a, one of the, the main selling features of the M4. Another one was the angled rewind crank. So the M3 it was a knob, you needed to pull it out, kind of rewind the film as if you're winding a watch between your thumb and your finger. And M4 came with a little crank that extended and you could wind it back really quickly compared to that. And uh, so later on the, the like MD got the same upgrade, it was called the MDA. And in 1971, the M4 uh, stopped and the M5 started. But I'll get back to the M5. Uh, after the M5, Leica released an upgrade of the M4. It's called the Leica M4P, or sorry, M42, uh, which was basically a version of the M4 made in Canada without the self timer. Uh, so it's a slightly later model. And also the, later on, there was an M4P, which was the same as M42, but it allowed a 28 millimeter lens and also made in Canada. Uh, Leica M5, which I mentioned before, that was released in 1971. That was the first Leica camera with a built-in through the lens metering. And one of the stories I heard is they changed the body shape uh, compared to the M4 because it needed to fit the electronics. The electronics at the time were not as advanced as they are nowadays, so they did need some space and therefore like a released a larger body. This is the, the camera, you might not see it on the picture, but it is larger than the M3 and the M4. It's a completely different body shape, a completely different design, and there's a light meter inside the camera that uh, you can see in the viewfinder. You can see it's reading in the viewfinder. It's coupled, and it's uh, it was a really good, useful camera at the time. But it was just a different uh, design than the uh, M cameras before. And in 1973, Leica started working with Minolta in, from Japan, and they released the Leica CL. Some of these cameras uh, say "Lights Minolta CL" on them, uh, and it was called at the time the poor man's Leica because it was a lot cheaper but it took, still took uh, the Leica M mount lenses. It had frames in the viewfinder for 40 millimeter, 50 millimeter and 90 millimeter lenses. And there, were, there was kind of a, a range of budget lenses available to buy with it. So you could use the, the normal M lenses, but you can use the ones that were released for the camera as well. And it had a twin model from Minolta. Uh, it's called the Minolta CLE, which is very, very similar, but the viewfinder also allows a 28 millimeter lens and the metering mechanism in it is almost the same as the M5. Uh, yep. Yeah. And M5 was in production for four years, then there was the M42, M4P, and in 94, 1984, Leica released the M6, 
which came back to the M4 body size. Uh, this is how the mechanism looked more or less. Oh, this is how it looked exactly. And the light bounced off the white dot that you see on the, in the middle here, and it was reflected onto this uh, this light meter here. And it was there was no moving parts in it, so it was very reliable, reliable, very accurate. And even nowadays, the Leica MP uses almost exactly the same uh, mechanism. Uh, yes, it's it's very useful, and you know the design proved itself over the years. And uh, later on, towards uh, the year 1998, uh, the Leica M6 was replaced with the Leica M6 TTL, which had an added functionality of through the lens metering for flash. So you could have very accurate flash. Uh, you could use flash, automatic flash with it, and it would be very accurate. Um, yeah, and it also had a larger uh, shutter speed dial. That's another way to tell the M6 TTL from normal M6. And I think the, it was larger because uh, to make sure it doesn't get in the way of the flash that sits on the hot shoe. So you could still quite easily change the shutter speed even though the flash is attached to the camera. Now uh, we're on to this millennium now. So year 2002 gave us the first Leica camera that could offer automatic exposure. Uh, it's not automatic exposure in the full sense of the word, but it's aperture priority, had an electronic shutter, uh, and it also had an automatic ISO DX code reader. So on the roll of film you buy nowadays, there is a, a special barcode and the camera could read that and know the ISO, so you didn't need to do it manually. Um, I'm especially guilty of forgetting to change the ISO when I change film on the cameras and I end up with incorrectly exposed rolls of film. So this is a really good camera for me. Uh, and But when Leica released the M7, they didn't forget about the Leica Purist. Same year, uh, we released the Leica MP, which is a tribute to the original MP. So it's got the same viewfinder as the M7. You could have some different viewfinder versions, uh, but it's purely mechanical. And the only thing operated by a battery in it is the light meter. So some people say it's almost exactly identical to the as the M6 Classic, but the rewind is a knob, not a crank. Uh, also a beautiful camera, very reliable, really good one to use. And quite recently, uh, Leica released the Leica MA, which is the latest of the Leica M, latest analog camera of the Leica M system. Uh, but it's not technology more advanced, it's a little bit step backwards, it's purely mechanical, no batteries. It's a camera for the curious. It's gonna probably last more than a hundred years because there's nothing to go wrong in it. You're never gonna need a battery. It's a beautiful, beautiful camera. Okay, that's uh, that's all the models I wanted to go through. Very, very uh, interesting. <laughs> uh, there were some special edition cameras and I think this, the idea of special edition started with cameras that were not intended as special editions. So there were some military which were basically there were engravings to to establish ownership or to, to mark ownership. So there was a Luftwaffe camera or German army, which is WH Wehrmacht here. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but Luftwaffe again to me means property of the Air Force. And they over the years have become collectible rare, and this engraving was very interesting. So even though it wasn't a special edition, they kind of have like a special edition feel to them. Uh, then there was a Leica MP, which again wasn't called a special edition, it's more of a special camera for a group of special customers. But also that, I think that was a build up to special editions. And the first special edition, in my opinion, is the 50 year, uh, 50 year of lights uh, Wetzler. And there was an engraving uh, on four different camera models. So there's the SL2, Leica M4, Leica M5, and the Leica CL. And that was, I think, the first time where Leica put an engraving on a camera to kind of make it special for customers. So this was the sp first special edition and that started a series of many different special editions to commemorate 
either events or cooperations with different like-minded minded brands. And there's a few uh, that I want to mention. There's no time to mention all of them, but my favorite ones are the Leica M6J. And this was a camera, uh, 40 cameras, uh, released for the Jubilee of the 40 years of the Leica M system. It was like an M6 styled like a like an M3, so it looks almost exactly identical to the M3, apart from a few details like the battery cover or the angled uh, rewind uh, crank. It's a really, really nice camera, and uh, I wish I had one of them in my collection now. There's a Leica a Jaguar XK uh, 150 in 1998. Leica and Jaguar released 50 cameras to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Jaguar XK 150. Lovely car and a lovely camera. Definitely one of my favorites. There's the Leica M6 Millennium. Beautiful black paint finish in the year 2000 to commemorate the, the new millennium. There was a 75 uh, cameras. And also uh, 75 years since the launch of the first uh, Leica One. So, so not only the new millennium, but also 75 years of, of Leica cameras being in production. And it came with some beautiful black paint lenses as well. And it's really nice to have black paint lens with a black paint camera. Uh, again, lovely. Uh, the 50 years of the Leica M system gave us the Leica M7 Titanium. It was a camera made of titanium and the lens external parts uh, made of titanium, of course. And the external parts of the lenses are made of titanium. Uh, there were sets with three lenses, 28, 50, and 90 millimeter. Uh, they're quite valuable nowadays, definitely collectible, um, and really, really nice. And one camera which I forgot to add here, but I think it's really important, is the M6 Einstück. And that's important because uh, it was sold together with a share in the company. So it was a share worth 500 Deutsche Mark. And it was not only a nice camera you got, you got, got a piece of Leica. So, so a real treat for uh, Leica enthusiasts. Um, a really important one. Um, yeah, uh, that's pretty much all the cameras. Uh, I wanted to give you some tips on using cameras because uh, some people that I, I've emailed with are only getting started on using vintage cameras. And I just want to give you some basic tips. So tip number one, if you use a Leica screw mount camera, like this one or similar, you can't put film uh, straight out of the box in it. So the film is normally cut like this, and you need to make sure you cut in the lead in tip longer. It needs to be at least 10 centimeters or four inches. Otherwise the camera will jam and you end up with bits of loose film inside the camera that could jam it even more. Um, you could either cut it yourself with scissors. Uh, it doesn't have to be measured scientifically 10 centimeters, just roughly 10 centimeters. Or you can get one of those vintage uh, um, film cut templates like you see on the picture here. And you just put the film in it and slide a knife on the edge and it just cuts the film to the perfect size and shape for you. But if you haven't got one of these, just use scissors, really, really, really easy. <clears throat> Oh, vintage cameras like this are not metered, so you need to know how to expose your photos correctly. Uh, I recommend using one of these. Uh, it's a very simple light meter. All light meters are similar and some simple vintage ones like this. This is not vintage, but it's similar to use to vintage Western meter or something like that. Really, really easy. You just select the ISO on this dial here. It shows in this window. Let's set mine to say 400 ISO. Then there's a button on the side here. A little red arrow moves, you align green arrow with the red arrow, and you'll see all the different combinations of aperture and shutter speed that you need to use. Really easy, quick, uh, not much thinking required. Definitely worth getting one of those. <clears throat> Uh, there's also lots of uh, light meter apps available for Apple and Android. I'm not going to recommend any by name because there's lots and uh, there's a lot of free ones. So just download one if you don't like it, get rid of it, try another one. I've tried a number of them and they all seem good. I haven't found a bad one yet. So just try one. 
And if you determine on not using any light meter, there's a thing called the Sunny 16 rule. And that's quite simple. So for example, if you've got uh, a 200 speed film and it's really sunny outside, set your aperture to F16 and set your shutter speed to the same speed as your film is. So if your speed is 200, set your shutter speed to 200. If your film is 400, set the shutter speed to 400. If your camera hasn't got 400 on the dial, just go the nearest figure, 500 on this camera, it's still gonna be fine. There's lots of tolerance when using film, especially black and white. And then as the condition, lighting conditions change, if it's a little bit cloudy, just uh, stop the aperture down, sorry, open the aperture a little bit to F11 and the darker it gets, open it a little bit more. <clears throat> film is forgiving, don't be afraid to experiment. Uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of latitude in film and uh, it's gonna be okay. Whatever you do, don't be afraid. Better to shoot uh, with wrong settings than not to take the photo of your life. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all the basic tips. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might There's have. There's plenty of questions, <coughs> so prepare. Okay. <laughs> so where, where, do, where do I begin? Um, let me have a look. So there's, there's a good question about film um, developing. Is there any way that you can actually recommend um, in London during lockdown to get film developed? I think there's a number of labs open, so all the major ones you can bring, drop film off or send them in. I spoke to Bayou today, which is my favorite lab in um, Newman Street, and they, they are open, they're working. You can give them a ring first and then you can drop it off or you can just put it in the post and send it to them. But if you don't uh, want to use Bayou, there's plenty of them. Just look online. Uh, it's quite easy to find one. Great, thank you. Um, question from Simon regarding his 3F. Um, mm -hmm. And it's in terms of how to use the focus and, and the frame viewer in terms of which one to do first. It's focus then frame, correct? Uh, I don't think there's a rule. Depends on really what you're doing. Uh, I, I would think focus then frame because if you've got a moving subject, you can pre if you predict where they're going to be, you can pre-focus on, let's say, a piece of, uh, of, of the floor where you, pre where you are expecting the subject to appear and then frame. Uh, but it really depends on the situation. As I don't think there is an easy answer to to that. Which one? Which one? On the on, on, on the rare occasions that I've been using the the Leica three, I, I always found it was for me it made more sense to do what you're saying, focus then frame. Yeah, yeah. I think that's easier, but it's not a rule. No rules. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Let me see here. Um, Capilla is um, asking. I've seen a conversion unit for M6 from film to digital made by I'm Back 35. Are you familiar with that? Have you heard of I've that? I've seen some articles online. I don't know anyone who's ever used this. Uh, I don't know if this is a product that exists yet or whether it's just a concept. Uh, if, if you're thinking of using it, definitely give us a shout if you got some feedback because I don't know anyone who's <laughs> ever used one, uh, but I've heard of them. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Stephen would like to know if you know that you know the Ur Leica is yeah. the you know if the lens is collapsible. It was a collapsible lens. Um, I don't think it, it had any engraving of what lens it was, but it was collapsible. Yes. I mean um, this. Yeah, sorry, we're going to add to that. There was a, a batch of non-working replicas released in. I think maybe the 90s. Um, so I did handle the non-working replica and remember it definitely, the lens was collapsing. Great, thank you. And um, this is a, maybe a tough question. Rosemary is asking, um, what camera, if you know, did um, Robert Kappa use for the D-Day landings? And would it have been waterproof at all? So it's probably what, 1944? It so it would have been... Definitely not waterproof. The most yeah. popular camera during World War II was the Leica 3C, I think. Uh, so um, if I don't know, but if I was guessing, I would say Leica 3C. Okay. And yeah, in terms of how how robust were they to the elements? Any idea? Uh, I think they were quite uh, robust. I mean, if it got wet, uh, apart from you know having water droplets on the lens and film, 
you could probably still take a photo at the faster shutter speeds. I think the slow shutter speeds would stop working if the camera got wet. Thank you. But I think the shutter speed that were needed to take photos at the D-Day landing were probably fast shutter speeds, so it was okay. Thank you. And Steve is asking whether the, the threes are easy to focus. Uh, they're not as easy to focus as autofocus camera, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think they're fairly easy to focus. I mean, it's, it's the same rangefinder mechanism as on most of Leica cameras. And uh, it might be not easy to focus if you're using wide aperture, but if you're using reasonable aperture, it's, it, yeah, it's quite easy to get a shot photo. Great. I'm just noticing um, uh, Douglas's comments. Not really a question. Um, but Oscar Barnick and Hair Lights always wore bow ties. Will this be a rule for the two of us going forward? <laughs> I think we're looking at implementing that as a like a dress code, yes. Bow tie and a t-shirt could be an interesting yeah. look. Um, do you know um, what year the M3, M2 and M1 were manufactured between? What years they were manufactured between? Uh, so Leica M3 started in 1954 and I can... Uh, Quickly look it up for you uh, when it stopped. One second. Uh, one take a sec. 54 it began. So production. 19, yes, and it ended in 1966. Um, so in 54, they were, they were slightly different. So the first Leica M3s had a, a double wind mechanism. So in order to advance one frame, you needed to wind it on twice. You needed to move the lever twice. And later on, uh, there were some improvements made on the camera, and one of them was a single wind. So later cameras, I think the change was around the serial number of one million, maybe, and you, you just needed to, to do one motion of the uh, uh, of the wind on, just and, and, leave it once. And what about the the two and the one? So M2 was 1958 to 1967. M1, 1959 to 1964. Right, and do you have any idea, by the way, why they went 321? Uh, I think the Leica M3, uh, the Leica 3 was the top model, and the M3 was just uh, an improved version corresponding to the 3. So it was supposed to be the top model as the Leica 3 was a top model. I see. Um, why um ramen is asking why is the the m6 so revered by leica users um i think uh first of all a lot of people like mechanical so people like mechanical watches and people like mechanical cameras because they understand how they work a little bit better than electronic things and also because they seem to be more reliable and the m6 is the most usable of the mechanical cameras like has ever made so uh, range finder cameras so it's got a built-in light meter it's got a really good viewfinder it can shoot uh, wide angle lenses from 28 millimeters so it's got lots of features that make it really usable great thank you um just one in the comments feed there where was it oh yeah the purpose what's the purpose of the offsetting on the m6 m6 shutter dial is it for saving battery life on the m6 shutter dial uh Yes, it's for saving battery life and also um, less tension on the shutter springs. And so when you switch the dial in there and you leave it for a long time. I don't know that for myself, I've never seen the springs, but someone told me once that it, it, there's less tension on the springs and you can store the camera for a longer time. Hmm. I think the main purpose is the battery life. Great, thank you. Do you have any idea um, what camera Cartier-Bresson used? I think he's had more than one model over the years. I think he started with one of the versions of the Leica 3, so maybe a 3B or something. With a 50 mil. But he, he yes, and, but he's moved on to the M system later. So uh, yeah, he's, he's used more than one camera in his history. Good, good. Um, um, Laurie's asking, what's the most modern or mechanical model available? Would be the MA. It's the MA, yeah. So it's the most modern. Uh, it's really, really nicely built, lovely finish. So yeah, 
and yeah that's actually currently still a camera in production it's a current model in production yeah you can just buy a brand new one with warranty and everything great um Oh, I'm just reading what's that one mean? Mm, any idea? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I don't know if you can answer this one, but do, is there any idea of, or plans for when the city store will reopen? Uh, the, well, we're definitely going to reopen. We don't know when yet. So, uh, probably not on the 15th uh, of June. So, 15th of June, there'll be uh, other of our stores opening and like a store city a little bit later, but we don't know the exact date yet. Thank you. Um, any idea as to how the M2 became more famous? How do you mean? More famous than the M3. Or Did it become more famous than the M3? I don't know if it has become more famous. I think the M3 is still the most iconic, the most famous Leica camera, or maybe even the most famous camera. Um, but AM2 had some features which made it more usable to certain photographers. So it allowed to use 35 millimeter lenses easily and it had this uh, manual the, the frame counter which you could change manually and a lot of professionals like that feature so i think it was a little bit more professional friendly um so good. maybe that's what they mean yeah good question um is there a good source steve's asking for serial numbers and production numbers yes uh book right there <laughs> <laughs> this book here is called the Leica Pocket Book. I've got the eighth edition. Our colleague David is working on the ninth edition with uh, some other people now. Uh, so the ninth edition should be available soon. Uh, but at the moment, it's, it's this one Leica Pocket Book. Thank you very much. Um, um, people say older cameras are better built, such as the M3. Is that true or just collector's snobbery? <laughs> I don't know if uh, they're necessarily better built. I think the ones that survived until this time are the really good examples. So one, I mean, they were, they were handmade cameras. So even though they're really good quality, always found it inconsistent, but the really good ones from the 50s are probably not being used anymore. Uh, and the good examples are still being used and the, 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 they're really well built. Uh, I think nowadays the build quality is a lot more consistent. So I don't think there's any, any problems with build quality of modern analog film cameras. Great, thank you. And I have a question here with regards to um, developing film at home. Are there any um, kits that you can recommend perhaps? Uh, there are some kits. Uh, there's a, a kit from Patterson and Infot that gives you all the chemicals and most of the tools that you need to develop your film. Or you can just uh, buy all the bits separately because I think some of those kits have things you don't necessarily need. So uh, you need a developing tank, you need some uh, measuring uh, jars for chemicals. Uh, and you, the developing tank is the main, the main thing, and uh, some bottles to store the store the chemicals in once you mix them together, and a black changing bag. Those are the main things, and then you need developer fixer, and stop bath. Uh, so you can buy these things separately, or Patterson makes a really good kit. And I think uh, I looked up this morning actually, you can get the kit with chemicals or without chemicals. So you can get just the tools and get your chemicals separately. And actually just on that, we're actually in talks um, with a photographer um, about doing a, a webinar of home developing. So the idea is that this photographer will be taking you through the whole process. So let us know actually if that's of interest. So, because it might be something we'll be adding fairly soon to our schedule. Um, what, is the difference between a coated and uncoated lens? Uh, so uncoated lenses were really early lenses. I think this one here from 1939 is uncoated. It means it's just pure glass. There isn't any anti-reflective coating in it. So sometimes you can have the same model of a, a vintage Leica lens and one of them can be coated, one of them can be uncoated. The uncoated one will give you a less contrasty look 
slightly more consistent with vintage photographs you find somewhere. So if you're looking for a really vintage look, you want an uncoated lens. And if you're looking for a slightly more modern contrasty look, then you want a coated lens. Thank you very much. Um, using Hans is saying using glasses is a pain on a screw mount Leica. What would you recommend if you can't wear contact lenses? So most of screw mount uh, cameras have got a degree of diopter adjustment. Uh, this one's got here. Some of them have got it next to the eyepiece. It's only very limited, uh, so. It depends on your prescription, but it might not go as far. It doesn't go as far as my prescription, certainly. So I need to use contact lenses. You can also, for framing, you can use external viewfinders that fit in the hot shoe. And some of the slightly more modern bright line finders are very big and they're quite usable with, uh, with glasses. But for focusing, I don't think there's an easy solution. <laughs> Thank you. Oh yeah, you mentioned um, the the kit for home developing. Patterson and what was the other company you mentioned? It was Ilford, wasn't so it? So Patterson makes the yeah. So it's two companies made a kit together. So Patterson are the developing tank and all the tools, and Ilford are the chemicals. So it's a, a kit of these two companies. Great. Um, question with regards to flash. Um, Raman's asking. What kind of flash would you recommend for use with the M6 TTL? Uh, probably the SF20D. Uh, so that was the flash that was available at the time. Uh, it's designed to work with the M6 TTL. Uh, it will give you all the functionality you need, and it's small, compact. And could you uh, use all, also you can more? use the you can use the modern flashes we offer. So SF26 is quite small. SF40, pretty much any any modern Leica flash. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Titsy is asking, if you could pick only one vintage Leica, what would you recommend oh, getting? <laughs> what, what, uh, what's the budget, I guess? Unlimited budget. <laughs> or is it, or? Let's, let's say, let's say un, one unlimited budget and another 500 pound budget. <laughs> okay. So if I had unlimited budget, I'd pick the Leica O, just because it's uh, such an important camera in photographic history. Do you know uh, how, so many, how many prototypes they made? So they made 31. Uh, they was to, that, is that production? No, there was like 31 prototypes. It was not in production. Never, yeah. so they, they made 31 cameras that were all, all kind of treated as prototypes. Uh, I think there's one at the upcoming lights auction and it's in silver and I've never seen a silver one before. So I wonder how much that's going to go for. And actually in terms of the auction, when is that happening? Uh, it's the first half of June, I think the 12th, if I'm correct. Uh, and up to 500 pounds, uh, it's not that easy to find one up to 500 pounds that's in nice condition. Uh, if you're not too fast about condition, you can probably find one of these, a Leica 3D with a lens for that sort of budget. Uh, you know, it could be a little bit rough cosmetically, but it would be working at 500 pounds working condition. Perfect. Thank you. Um, another question here from Steve that says, I had the issue yesterday when I took possession of my 3C. I trimmed the film as per the instructions, but it jammed and I eventually was able to, re eventually was able to rewind it back inside the spool. I tried another film without trimming and it appears to have loaded okay. I'm just about to try it out for the first time. Uh, so it's possible to load film without trimming and probably about seven times out of 10, sorry, three times out of 10, it will be fine, but about seven times out of, out of 10 will jam. So I have uh, in my history of using like I sometimes forgotten to trim the film and loaded it and it was fine. But sometimes you forget to trim the film, you load it and it rips and then you've got loose bits of film inside the camera and it's really difficult to take them out and then the camera jumps completely. So uh, don't be tempted to not trim the film because that can end up badly. Um, I don't know why your camera jammed with the trim film. Maybe there was something something else not loaded correctly. They are a little bit tricky, the screw mount cameras to load and they take a little bit of practice. 
And I think uh, it's a good idea to get a dummy film that you're not worried about uh, wasting and try cutting the lead in a couple of times and loading it, rewinding and loading again, just to, so you get the practice, you get the hang of it um, before you load the real film in. That's, that's ex I mean, from my experience with the, I think it was a 3F, I had to do the same thing. And the first, I used a dummy film, as you say, and the first few times it was useless. And then you Yeah, you, could, you can cut the lead in as many times as you want because it doesn't matter. You just don't have to use the whole thing. So you can chop it off, try cutting it again. Once you do it once, chop it a little bit more. And uh, yeah, you can waste the whole voice. Perfect. Um, Another question from Steve um, saying, Sunny 16, my aperture ring F2 sonar only goes to F12.5. When did the range change to up to F22? Uh, so different lenses have different uh, narrowest aperture and it's all determined by the diffraction of the lens. So some lenses, when you should really narrow apertures, they lose quality. And that's why the manufacturers limit them. So the lens I've got here is also 12.5. Oh, no, but, but do, do, do you know when it changed from, from them doing a, a 12.5 to an F22? I don't think there's a date. It depends on, on particular lenses. So modern yeah. lenses, a lot of them are 16, but some are 22. Uh, I don't uh, think there's a particular date. It just depends on the lens design. Uh, and if your lens doesn't go to 16, you just need to use uh, a faster shutter speed, slightly, just you know, one click faster. Great, thank you. And actually, just Donald saying another tip in terms of loading the film. It helps to put a little tension on the film when the rewind knob on um, on the film with the rewind knob before fully loading it. That's a really good uh, good tip, which uh, I should have said in the first place. So you can pick up the slack with this uh, a little bit before closing the, the base plate. So put the film in and pick up the slack, make sure it's not loose with this. That's right. a really good tip, thank you. Um, and Simon's asking, would you recommend, um, what would you recommend for cleaning the camera's exterior, if at all? Uh, it depends how, uh, I mean, if it's a, a rare collectible camera, camera, just don't clean it at all. Uh, and if the camera is sort of uh, a little bit more common, then you can be a little bit braver. Uh, try just a, a dry cloth first, and then maybe a slightly damp cloth, maybe a little bit of lens cleaning liquid helps. Uh, I know some people use uh, the dashboard cleaner on leathers to give them a nice look. Uh, it, Gives them a little bit of a greasy look as well, but if, you, if you're looking for a nice shiny look, dashboard cleaners have been known to be used. Great, sure, thank you. And, um, for dashboards of cars. Yeah, uh, Raphael's asking, if he's not mistaken, there's a reproduction of Ur Leica. Do you know about that? Yes, so there was a, a series of non-working replicas released by Leica. Oh, and you were saying also second to that question, um, does it have the same function? No, it doesn't work. So it's, no. it's, just, it's just a dummy, yeah. There was a working replica of the old Leica, uh, and that was between the year 2000 and 2004. There were two versions released by Leica, uh, and I had the pleasure of using them. I didn't use the actual old Leica, but I used the replicas and they're really cool cameras to use uh, and come with a really nice lens. Great, thank you. Um, does a red yellow filter on the rangefinder window help with focusing? Yeah, that, that gives you slightly more contrast in the focus uh, and it makes it easier to focus, yes. I didn't know so about that. Little, little tiny filters that fit all, over these uh, rangefinder windows here. Did Leica actually produce those, as in, was that something you They did buy? produce them. Uh, well, you can't buy it now, but something you could buy from like a the days, yeah. back in the days, yes. Um, great. What else do we have here? Um, who has the most robust body and mechanism? The M3, M2, or M1? I think M3, M2, M1, they all use the same, uh, same bodies and they're all... Uh, pretty much the same camera. The M1 has the least moving parts because it hasn't got the rangefinder, so that's 
probably going to survive the most, but they're all very similar. Great. And will Leica still service a, a three? Yes, uh, Leica can still service a, a three or an M3. Um, I think like a three. The, three. Yeah. Uh, so we are working on being able to service them here in the UK. The camera you see on the photo here is our kind of uh, something we've been practicing on. Uh, and we hope to be able to service them here. But at the moment, uh, to a limited extent, it can be serviced in Leica Germany. So not everything can be repaired. And um, I don't suppose you could give a approximate cost uh, so all the estimates are, are done on individual cameras. They don't need to be uh, seen to be estimated because the, the extent of the work can be different. So can't really quote without yeah. seeing the camera. And it wouldn't be me seeing it. It has to be a technician. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Um, Robin is asking, a different Robin. Robin is asking, <laughs> is it true that film M cameras are increasing in value? Yes, over the past few years, they've, they've increased a lot. Um, you know, cameras like the M6, M4, M3, they've all gone up in value more than in inflation. So they uh, seem to be a really good investment. Thank you. Do you know if um, Salgado used an M camera? I th I'm pretty sure he has, because all the major photographers used an M camera at some point, but I can't think of an example of a photo taken by Salgado with an I'm M pretty camera. sure he did as well. And it's, there's a very famous image of being near some, something burning. And I can't remember what it is, because I remember he was working very near to something very, like fire. I can't remember. Was oil? Was that, it? Image, that image kind of came to my mind as well, but I didn't want to say it because I'm not sure it was taken with him. Is, is the two, uh, is a uh, fire? Again, I think it's like rumors that I've heard that have been passed down to me that Leica kept on having to provide him with more equipment because he kept on destroying them in the field. All right. <laughs> but again, this could be a, a myth. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Salgado used an M camera at some point. That, that's, uh, that's, that's a certain. Okay. Um, how regularly does a lightly used camera require to be serviced? Uh, it all depends on how it's stored. So if, you, if you've if you got a mechanical camera that's lightly used and stored in, in good sort of not to dry, not to humid condition, conditions, it probably might never need servicing. Uh, so light to use is really good because unused cameras tend to stop working after a number of years because all the lubricants dry out and, and kind of uh, get sticky. But if you store it in a place that's not too dry and not too wet, I don't think you'll ever need to service it. Thank you. Um, Steve's asking, is there any truth in the rumor that Leica never wanted to originally produce cameras as they already had a successful optics company? Any ideas? It's actually in a, uh, in a company training for Leica's history. There was a big, uh, big discussion in Leica at the time when Oscar Barna produced the, uh, the prototypes and he showed them to earn slides. And the whole board board of Leica didn't want to make any cameras because they thought that's a, that's a waste of money and a silly investment and, and it's never going to bring any return. And Oscar Barnard decided against the board of the company and started uh, making the cameras, which was a really good decision. <laughs> Indeed it was. Um, does trimming, trimming the film apply to the M6? No, you can just uh, put normal film in the M6. It doesn't need to be trimmed. All the M cameras, uh, they take just uh, standard film straight out of the box. Good question here from um, Ramin saying, how do you recommend testing an older Leica out? I.e., if you were to shoot a test roll, what would you try um, to look out for? Uh, so I would probably fire it at all the different shutter speeds and take a photo at all the different shutter speeds. So things to watch out for are the extreme slow shutter speeds and the extreme fast shutter speeds. So uh, make sure that they expose properly or they expose at all at, at the two extreme ends of shutter speeds. Uh, check the focusing. So try to uh, take a photo of a wall at a 45 degree angle and see if the focus is where you want, to, where you want it. Uh, yeah, make sure none of the bits fall off the camera. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
great. Thank you. Um, what is Mark saying here? Is there an undervalued overlooked gem among vintage analog Leicas? And will any of the digitals um, that are you know being produced now will they be uh, will they be still functioning in eighty years time? Um, I think some of them probably will still be functioning, but it might be difficult to find a memory card or a battery for them. Just to answer the the, the latter part, yeah. So I think batteries and memory cards will be difficult in eighty years time because the technology is going to change. Uh, so if you've got one and you plan to use it in 80 years time, make sure you hold on to the memory card, uh, definitely. Uh, an undervalued gem, uh, I think probably the M4P and M42 are undervalued gem. They're not, they don't uh, fetch as much as some other cameras, uh, but they're still really, really good, reliable cameras that they will give you years and years of use. Oh, well, now you've said it after this webinar, the price is going to rocket up. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of the digital ones, what was it, the M8 2006? So we only know that an, an M8 from 2006 still functions. As it, they, still, it, they still function. Uh, they still can be repaired to an extent. Not everything can be repaired on them anymore. Uh, so, and that, there's a thing about memory cards uh, that they only go up to a certain size, I think. Only up to 16 gigabyte, and that's right. I imagine in They're five hard, years you can't actually maybe get those cards anymore. Yeah, you're right. I think you can probably still get them now, but in five years' time, it's probably going to be difficult to find a 16 gig card. Yeah. Um, let me see. See, that's not a question. I'm just checking if I missed anything. I think that that's all of them. Really? I think that was about 40 questions that you just answered there. So well done. <laughs> okay, lovely. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you. I'm falling asleep, uh, especially if in the Philippines. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's probably midnight there now. So yeah, well, well done. <laughs> yeah. with this. No, that was really interesting. Thank you very much, Jacob. Pleasure. Thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Cheers. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye.